Hey guys, I'm Herb Jordan, and this is Life Track 301. We're going to talk about discipleship tonight. Last week in 201, you learned about investorship and membership at Rejuvenate Church. Now we're going to go a little deeper. So if you'll turn in your books to page 39, you'll see an information sheet here that we'd like you to fill out at your leisure and turn in to either myself or Pastor Jason when you uh, have completed it. So let's jump right in. We're on page 41, the introduction, the purpose of this class. That you may become mature Christians and may fulfill God's will for you. That's Colossians 4.12. We are not meant to remain as children, but to grow up in every way into Christ. That's Ephesians 4.14 and 15. So if we're not to remain as children, that we're to be fully mature in Christ, what does that mean? Let's talk about it. Number one, what is spiritual maturity? Spiritual maturity is being like Christ. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to Him should become like His Son. That's Romans 8, 29. So that's the end game. Is that we get ourselves out of the way, that we decrease so that Christ can increase in us and so that we can become more like Him. After all, we were created in His image. Shouldn't we hearken back to that very image? Number two, facts about spiritual maturity. Number one, it's not automatic. What am I saying here? It's your job to grow. It's not Pastor Jason's job to grow you. It's his job to present information. It's your job what you do with it. Number two, it's a process. You're not going to become fully mature overnight. It's just not going to happen. It takes discipline. You have to make discipleship a habitual part of your life. It has to be who you are. Otherwise, you won't do it. Number three, understanding discipleship. Mature believers are called disciples. The term disciple comes from the word discipline. You don't have to know Latin or Greek to know that. That's pretty obvious. So to be a disciple requires some discipline in your life. The more like Christ I become, the more God can use me. And the mark of a disciple is cross-bearing. Bearing our cross. Whatever it is God's called us to do, whatever cross we have to bear, whatever burden we have in life, whatever struggle we may have to go through, whatever suffering we endure for the cause of Christ, we need to be willing to bear. How often am I to do this? Daily. Number five is daily. Number six, what is involved in cross-bearing? Whatever it takes to give Christ first place in my life. Whatever hindrances that try to come at me, whatever the plans of the enemy, whatever, whatever it is I have to go through in life, that all falls at the foot of the cross, which I bear with honor. Point five, how can I become a disciple? By developing the habits of a disciple. Number one, that's Bible study and prayer. And that's a daily Bible study and prayer. We need to be in the Word daily. We need to be communing with God daily. Number two, fellowship with other believers. We talked about that last week, the need for fellowship, the need to be here and be a part of it because we're a family and families need to stick together. Number three, growing spiritually by living a Spirit-led life. Whatever the Spirit of God tells you, you need to follow it. But we also need to be disciplined enough in our spirits to follow Him and to hear His voice. We need to be able to discern His voice above all others. And again, that takes discipline. It takes study. It takes prayer. Sheep know their shepherd's voice, but it doesn't happen overnight. They have to listen, and that takes discipline. And number four, giving of yourself. Time, talents, resources, money. Whatever you have to give, give it. The goal of this class that I will commit to the habits necessary for spiritual maturity. Habit one, let's break them down. Bible study and prayer. I love this scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. Another version says the 
all scripture is God breathed. That means God literally breathed the words of the Bible into the hearts and lives of the men who wrote it. That's amazing to me. How to get more from my Bible? I must accept its authority. First of all, we have to believe. We talked about it last week being an essential truth. We have to believe the Word of God is the Word of God, that it's fully truth, that there's not a lie in it, that it's inerrant, that it's authoritative. We believe in the closed canon of Scripture. There are not, nor will there ever be, any other books, verses, or ideas added to it. The Bible is plain when it says not to be added to or taken from. All preaching, teaching, prophesying, or any other communication being declared in the name of the Lord is subject to measurement by the content of the Word of God. And if it doesn't line up with the Word, toss it out. It has to line up with the Word of God. Otherwise, it's not truth. Number two, I must assimilate its truths. I must assimilate its truths. A, hearing God's Word. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God. And B, reading God's Word. Happy is the one who reads this book and obeys what is written in it. How often shall I read God's Word? Daily. C, page 44, studying God's Word. They accepted the message eagerly and studied the Scriptures every day. The Bible also says study to show yourselves approved. That also alludes to being fully mature. D, memorizing God's Word. Guard my words as your most precious, precious possession. Write them down and also keep them deep within your heart. Why? So that when we need them, we can call upon them. So when someone presents us with an untruth, we can confront an untruth with truth. So that we're in our darkest hour, God will recall the scripture that we know to strengthen us. And so that we may lift ourselves up in the word. E, meditating on God's word. Those who are always meditating on His laws are like trees along a river bank bearing fruit. They will never wither, and whatever they do prospers. That's a great promise. That if we continue meditating on the Word, everything we put forth our hands to do is going to prosper. Meditation is focused thinking about a Bible verse in order to discover how to apply its truth to life. We're not talking about uh, the Zen master here. We're not talking about trying to find our state of euphoria or anything like that. We're talking about deep, focused thinking on the Word of God about a particular verse or passage to really dig out the true meaning for our lives. F, receiving God's Word with an open heart. That's the key. If we're closed off to the Word, we can't prosper in it. If we're open to receive it, even if it's a rebuke, if we're open to receive it, we can receive it in love, number one, and number two, we can grow from it. Three, I must apply its principles. Once you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. It's not enough to know the Word of God, and it's not enough to hear the Word of God. We have to do the Word of God. Otherwise, how can it prosper? And you see uh, A here, claim His promises. There are several different verses here to claim when you're going through issues, battles and struggles, if, if, if you're dealing with money, fear, sickness, confidence, safety. I would pray that you commit these to memory and pray them over your lives and over the lives of your family members. And B, share it with others. C, page 45, how to apply Scripture. There's some questions you need to ask yourself. Number one, what did it mean to the original hearers? In other words, what's the context of the verse as it, as it was written? Is there any historical significance? Uh, was, was the individual writing the verse talking to a specific set of people, a, a, a specific group of folks, you need to know the context because it may change the meaning for you. Second question, what is the underlying timeless principle? In other words, what's practical? What does it mean to me today? What is the truth I can draw from a 2,000-year-old word that works for me today? What's the practicality of it? And third, ask, how could I practice that principle? How can I walk it out? How can I live it daily? Roman numeral 2, talking with God. Always be joyful, joyful, never stop praying. Pray without ceasing. Always be in an attitude of prayer, a spirit of prayer. Always be willing to stop what you're doing if you feel led to pray for someone or something. 
that's called fellowship with God. And that's how we were created. God walked and talked with Adam and Eve every day. That's how we walk and talk with God today. It's through prayer and, and, uh, and communication with Him. The purpose of daily prayer time, A, to give devotion to God. To give devotion to God. That's taking time, spending time, giving time. It's making devotion a priority. B, to get direction from God. To get direction from God. Show me the path where I should go, O Lord. Point out the right road for me to walk. Lead me. And if you ask God to lead you, He'll guide you and direct your steps. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. That's a biblical promise. C, to gain delight in God. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. We love to focus on that desires of your heart part. But to gain the desires of our heart, we need to delight ourselves in the Lord. Why? Because then our desires become what He desires for us. Their healthy desires. Their desires to prosper us and not to tear us down. And D, to grow more like God. That's what discipleship is in a nutshell. It's becoming more like Christ. Two, how to begin a daily prayer time. We talk about this because I can't assume that everyone knows how to pray. That everyone knows how to make that a lifestyle. So that's why we teach it. A, select a specific time and place. And you know what? You need to know yourself here. If you're more alert and focused at night, you need to set aside, set aside time at night to pray. If you're like me and you're more focused in the morning, you need to pray in the morning for your, your Bible study and prayer time. And you need to have a specific place, whether that be in your bedroom, whether that be in a broom closet, whether that be um, at your workstation, whatever area you can get in and be alone with God. I like to pray a lot on my way to work while I'm driving. Whatever works for you. But you need to know that about yourself. Follow a simple plan. Don't try to read an entire book of the Bible in a day. You're going to exhaust yourself and you're not going to learn a thing. Here's a good uh, prayer routine on page 46. How to spend 15 minutes with God. Number one, read a verse. Take four minutes to read a verse. Number two, reflect on that verse. That's, that's the meditation part. That's studying that verse. Looking at it, reading it again, focusing on it. That's four minutes. Record what God desires of you. Whatever you feel Him speaking in your spirit, write it down. Take three minutes to do that. Pray. Request from God. Whatever you feel led to pray for or about. Take four minutes to do that. And you've spent 15 minutes in prayer. And Bible study. That's an awesome thing and it hasn't taken an, uh, your entire day. And then continuously be in an attitude of prayer throughout the day. And you also see there that there are other uh, prayer and Bible study resources in the appendix of your notebook there. So let's talk about uh, the model Jesus gave us. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's really His ideal prayer for us. This then is how you should pray. A. Praise. I begin by expressing love to God. By showing honor to God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's calling Him who He is. That's giving Him honor for His title and for His uh, position. B, purpose. I commit myself to doing God's will. The mission of Rejuvenate Church. Doing what He's called us to do. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's how this earth was created. And that's what we're trying to shift it back to. C, provision. I ask God to provide my daily needs. Give us today our daily bread. D, pardon. I ask God to forgive my sins. Forgive us our debts. And we understand that all of our sins are covered under the blood. We still need to ask forgiveness. We need to acknowledge that we make mistakes and that we've made mistakes. And we need to ask earnestly that God forgive those mistakes. E, pray for other people. As we also forgive our debtors. So not only do we need forgiveness, we need to forgive those who've wronged us. And forgiveness is huge. And you've probably heard this a million times, but it rings true even today. Forgiveness is not for them. It's for you. They may not ever know you forgave them. 
But if you've truly released them in your heart, you bear no ill will toward them. You're not bound by what they did to you. As long as you hold on to it, they have power over you, even if they don't realize they have power. You've got to let it go. You've got to forgive. And protection. I ask for spiritual protection. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God promises He'll always make a way out. We need to pray for that way out. We don't need to put ourselves in a situation that we can be tempted or that we can fall. But if we find ourselves in those situations, we need to pray for that way out. Habit number two, fellowship with other believers. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage each other. Don't forsake the fellowship of the saints. We've got to remain one body, connected to one another. How can a church grow large yet maintain close friendships? We touched on it last week. Every member needs to be a part of a small group or a life group. And we are integrating small groups into Rejuvenate Church. Again, I touched on it last week. I'll go, I'll go even deeper into detail this week. What is the purpose of small groups? Number one, they provide opportunities for Bible study. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Again, this was the, the, the early church's model, and we need to hearken back to it. We need to share the gospel with one another. We need to study the Bible in our small groups. Fellowship. That's why we get together in the first place, to connect, to become one with each other, to grow our family. Three, communion. And they're talking about the breaking of bread here. Now, food obviously doesn't have to accompany every small group. Now, now looking at me, you know, I, I like food. So if I'm a part of your small group and you decide you want to have food, I'm going to let you. But more than anything, communion with one another, communion with God. Communion equals communication. Number four, prayer. That's, that's an essential part of any small group, regardless of the setting. And five, support. They gave it to everyone as he had need. Whatever they have need of. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, financially. We need to build into each other. Six, praise. Why get together if you don't have something to praise? More importantly, someone to praise. And seven, outreach. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. A successful small group grows. Because people hear about it. They're drawn into it. They're invited by other members of the small group. They're integrated. Let's talk about some small group ground rules. To those in my group, I commit to number one, make our group a priority. That talks about meeting with frequency. Not necessarily every week, but I'd say at least once a month or a couple of times a month if you can do it. Share my true feelings. Be authentic. Be transparent. Be willing to share from the heart. Encourage our spiritual growth. That's huge. That's what the small group's for. Respect our differences. That's give each other courtesy. Remember we talked about the non-essential beliefs last week, the personal convictions? Give each other grace and courtesy in those. Support you in times of need. That's huge. Remember a small group is a place of protection. Accept your weaknesses. And that's where we truly have the opportunity to build and edify. We can help gird each other up in our weaknesses. Speak the truth in love. That's being honest. It's calling a spade a spade. It's, it's loving your small group enough to say, hey, we might need to tighten up the screws in this area. And receiving that with love as well. Forgive when I am hurt. And show each other mercy in hopes that we are also shown mercy. Keep your confidences. Remember, your small group should be a safe place. Whatever I uh, share in a small group should stay in a small group. Support our purposes. That's being unified. One mind and one accord. Habit three, growing spiritually by living a spirit-led life. The scripture from Acts here says, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. So we're talking about that same Holy Spirit that came upon them in Acts. How was the Holy Spirit first revealed? We know the story about the day of Pentecost when they were gathered together, 120 of them in the upper room, in one mind and one accord, and the Holy Spirit came on them like cloven tongues of fire. And they were endued with power from on high. And they went out that very day preaching and teaching the gospel, and over 3,000 came to the Lord as a result of the power they walked in. Who is the Holy Spirit? Number one, He's a person. Number two, He's the third person of the Trinity. Now that doesn't mean He's third in rank. All three parts of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are equal to one another. And they're also of equal importance. Number three, what does Spirit-led living produce in our lives? Number one, comfort. And I will pray the Father and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. He comforts our souls. He leads us and guides us. Conviction. He also acts as our conscience. He shows us the right path and He lets us know when we've deviated from that path. Number three, guidance. But when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you in all truth. And that's what He does. Like I said earlier, He's a spiritual GPS. He leads our paths. He guides us. Number four, power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And we mean true power and authority. It bestows an anointing upon us to do the work that we've been called to do. Number five, character. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And those are the attributes that the Spirit gives us to walk in. That's real character. Real moral fiber. And six, spiritual gifts. And we'll, we'll explore our spiritual gifts next week in 401. But He certainly exposes our gift to the world, number one. But He also cultivates it within us. Point four, living a supernatural life. God desires to give us dreams, number one. A dream is a picture you have in your mind of a desired future. That which gets inside you and is beyond reason and bigger than you or your own. We're talking about the big picture kinds of dreams. He gives you visions. A vision is that which is seen. An awake dream. You see something already done. You see something in how-to steps. That's giving us the plan to walk out those dreams. Three, prophecy. To prophesy is to speak forth biblical truth in the mind and counsel of God that cannot be known through natural means. That's when you're literally given a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge to either speak to an individual or to a body, a corporate body of believers that acts as sometimes a rebuke, sometimes a warning, sometimes an edification. But it's always meant to edify. It's always meant to build up. Number five, how do I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? First, we have to remove all barriers. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've got to remove all the obstacles in your life that have separated you from God and separated you from the Spirit. Number two, request the Holy Spirit. He's a gentleman. He never forces his way in. But when you ask for Him, He'll come. And number three, release the gifts. This is truly what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. He cultivates those gifts and then He exposes them so that the body may benefit from them. Habit number four, giving of yourself. There are three areas of giving we want to talk about tonight. Number one, give of your time. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Number two, give of your talents. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Remember, I've talked about it before. Your gift is not for you. It's for the body. And number three, give of your treasure. If your gift is giving, give generously. The Bible also says where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. 
And I like to go even further. Show me your bank statement, I'll show you where your heart is. Show me your wallet, I'll show you where your heart is. Show me your credit card bill, I'll show you where your heart is. As long as our pocketbooks have become our treasure, that's where our heart's going to go. We need to be able to release that. The Bible says you can't serve both God and money. We need to serve God and let our money serve God as well. Seven benefits of giving. Giving makes me become like God. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. He's the ultimate example of giving. We need to mim mimic and mirror that. Giving draws me closer to God. It draws me closer to God. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. Just what I was talking about. Giving is the antidote to materialism. Again, as I said, if your heart is attached to your wallet, your heart can't be truly devoted to God. So if we can cultivate the spirit of giving in our lives, we draw closer to God and we draw farther away from being bound by our pocketbooks. Giving strengthens my faith. Giving is the fruit of faith. And again, I encourage you to be spirit-led in your giving. Whatever God says give, regardless of the percentage, whatever He says give, give it. And give it cheerfully. Giving is an investment in eternity. Give happily to those in need and always be ready to share whatever God has given you. By doing this, you will be storing up real treasure for yourselves in heaven. So you're making an investment not only into the lives of others, but an eternal investment for your own life. Giving blesses me in return. A generous man himself will be blessed. That's a biblical promise from Proverbs. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. That's, a, that's reiterating uh, that same promise. Giving makes me happy. There's more happiness in giving than receiving. We've heard it a million times in our lives. It's more blessed to give and receive than to receive. But it's the absolute truth. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Number three, giving with the right attitudes. You have to give willingly. You can't give begrudgingly. You can't give compulsively. You can't give out of fear of being cursed. You have to give willingly. Which leads me to point number two, you have to give cheerfully. If you're bound up by the principle of giving, you can't give cheerfully. If, if it bothers you, to have to give what you give, you're not giving cheerfully. Cheerful giving says, whatever you say, Lord, I'll do it. And I don't have a problem doing it. And give sacrificially. I'm reminded of the story of the widow and the mite, where Jesus sat in the back of the congregation near the offering plate because He wanted to see how people gave. Not what they gave, but how they gave. And He watched the religious folk parade themselves and throw plenty of money in out of their abundance, not really making a sacrifice, and doing it vainly to be seen. But he saw the widow woman who gave the last mite she had in her possession, which in today's economy, a mite is a fraction of a penny, so it was next to nothing. But that's what she had, and she gave it. And Jesus said, her offering is much more blessed than yours. Because you gave out of your abundance. You gave out of vanity. She gave as a sacrifice. And number four, give expectantly. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Talked about it last week. When we sow, it's like a farmer sowing a seed. When a farmer sows a corn seed, he gets a corn crop. He doesn't get another corn seed. The harvest is exponentially greater than the investment. The seed always produces 30, 60, 100 fold. So give generously. You cannot outgive the Lord. It's impossible. He's not going to be outgiven. So, whatever your best gift is, not only is He going to match it, He's going to multiply it. Essential habits of a healthy believer. Number one, Bible study and prayer. That's weekend services. That's how that plays out. Number two, fellowshipping with others. We do that in small groups. Number three, growing spiritually. That's what we're doing right now. Life track. 
phase one and phase two. And giving of yourself, dream team. That's ministry. So remember as we become disciples, as we continue going forward in discipleship, as we enter into small groups, that those small groups are not just groups of folks meeting outside the church walls, but we also have a great small group opportunity every Wednesday night. After you've completed this uh, life track phase one and you move into phase two, that's a small group there too. We're really growing and digging and getting deeper in God. That's real grassroots discipleship. So don't forsake that. Think of it that way. That our Wednesday night sessions, just because you finish this booklet, doesn't mean you finish life track. It continues on from here. And you have a real opportunity to join that small group and to grow with God. Well, that's it for 301. You've got one more week left. I'll see you next week for 401 Discovery.